All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another lesson with Dennis the Professor. Dennis the Professor. And today, we'll be studying personal finance. And hopefully, helping you get the tools you need to repay your debt, earn wealth, and achieve income independence. Right? That's our goal with this class. Okay. So... Let's begin. So the idea here, sorry, I need to get a new piece of chalk, but the idea here is to introduce you to a practical framework, to a practical framework for thinking about personal finance. And a lot of the ways you can add it and you can work with it, right? So, this class will be predominantly focused on application, right? So we're going to be light on theory. There's not any extensive math, right? So it's math free. As a matter of fact, everywhere where I can tell you to use software, I will tell you to use software, right? And finally, we'll be focusing on having a broad application, which means we won't just be discussing some theoretical case of someone that has millions of dollars and you know a great job and all this stuff and they're able to pay back all your income. Instead, we'll be focusing on your case, the student's case in general and in particular. And we'll be learning how you can leverage the tools that you learn about here in personal finance in order to achieve whatever your goals are. Right? And those goals can include things like paying off your debt, like amassing wealth, like having a great lifestyle that you desire, achieving income independence and never having to work again, and of course, mitigating a lot of the risks that come with personal finance. Right, So you're going to make decisions in personal finance your entire life. This is simply a reality for every single person that exists in a capitalist environment. Right, You will be making these decisions the entire life, your all of your life, right? I can't stress this enough. No matter how much money you have, no matter how good things seem, no matter how bad things seem, no matter how old or young you are, you will be making these decisions regularly. And so, it's important to understand what you can do in order to make better decisions. And by better decisions, I don't mean the decisions that I say are good, right? These aren't the decisions that I say are good. The decisions that you'll be making are the decisions that further your goals, that further your ability to succeed and your ability to get what you want out of life. Right? So sometimes your decisions will be deliberate. Right? This won't always be the case. Right? Sometimes you'll be able to plan something out and it'll happen similar to how you expect it to happen. Right, and so you'll be able to follow through and see kind of the results of your decisions, right? But sometimes you'll be forced to make a decision on the spot. And believe it or not, the decisions on the spot are going to be some of the most critical that you make, right? So you can plan to have a house and a mortgage and all those things and save up money and borrow money from the bank and put all that together, right? But for an on the spot decision, if your spouse suddenly gets pregnant and you decide to have a child, that could be an on-the-spot decision, right? And so you need to understand your financial situation, your financial position, and how that affects everything that you've been planning up to now and how you can now adjust in order to meet new needs, right? So at the basis, personal financial planning is like planning anything else, right? It's like planning a wedding, it's like planning a birthday party, it's like planning what you're going to do this afternoon, right? So you're going to consider some factors 
And then you're going to consider some possible decisions that you can make, right? The more transparent and the more able you're able to look at factors and say, well, these are the actual factors of my life. I'm being honest with myself and this is where things are, right? The better informed your decisions will be and the better you will make, or the better you'll be able to make good decisions, right? So the thing not to expect is don't expect that you will take this class and then all of a sudden, you will attain mastery, right? That's simply not going to happen, right? You may take this class and you may learn some things. You may rewatch it or come back to it or experiment some more, right? But mastery will happen over time, right? And the reason mastery will happen over time is that you'll be doing this for a very, very long time. You'll be iterating on your decisions. You'll be exploring new options and understanding how different things come together. Right, so nothing's going to happen overnight. Right, keep that in mind. When you're doing your planning, the most important factor of your planning won't be your goals or anything else. It'll be information. And the majority of today's lesson will work around obtaining this information and leveraging it to help you make decisions. Right? But this information is extremely important, right? Information about how you spend your money, how you save your money, how much money you make, what the income potential is of what you're doing, right? Could you diversify that income? Could you invest in different assets, right? What are you doing with your excess money? What are you doing with the debt that you should be repaying, right? How are you planning for all of that, right? And that's extremely important. But just having the information isn't enough, right? And this is where you come in. So I can hand you the tools to obtain and process the information. What I can't give you is context, right? In a broad economic sense, I can do this, right? So I can tell you that the economy is heating up and that jobs are in short supply and that people are hiring and that wages are going up. What I can't tell you is whether or not you have three kids, five kids or no kids, whether or not your aging parents depend on your income, and whether or not you're going to get a raise next week, right? That's up to you to judge and value. And so you're going to take this information and you're going to apply it to your specific context. And we're going to go through all the tools and exercises necessary to find out this context. So, first things first, there are going to be some individual factors to your context and to your decisions, right? Some individual factors. This is an important piece, right? Because there are circumstances in your life that are going to affect, they're going to affect your plan, right? Regardless of whether or not you think they will now, we will find that they will in fact affect your plan over time, right? So the first thing we want to look at that will affect your plan is your family structure. Like I said before, right? You might be single, right? Or you might be married. If you're married, you may want to work with your spouse on a financial plan, right? Or on some joint goals and on some separate goals, right? If you have dependents, people that you care for, right? Whether they're children or aging parents or grandparents or nieces or uncles or nephews, whatever it is, right? You need to plan to be able to provide for these people, right? So this will require you, if you do have dependents, if you do have people depending on you, you will need to have additional income, right? Because they will raise your expenses, right? You need to plan around having additional disposable income and how you're going to do that, right? You will find that if you're not currently in the stage of your life where you do have dependents, that having dependents makes you more risk averse or it makes you more resistant to taking risks and the reason you don't want to take risks is because when you're younger and you're on your own and you take a risk that risk only affects you but as you get older and as you have dependents and as you have a family and a spouse and so on and so forth your risks affect everyone that depends on you and so your risks higher have a lot more gravity the one thing 
I will note, and this is a personal note, right? So one of the things that I try to do with my lectures and, and you know my explanations is I try to inject a little bit of a personal note here and there just on things that I think people overlook and that aren't often written out in text, right? So there's a misunderstanding of risk. There's financial risk, and then there's personal risk, right? I guess there's also bodily risk. Now that I think about it, right, you should, you should really, unless it's necessary, try not to risk your you know, ability to function in a body for most things, right? You're gonna wanna pretty much keep that safe. That's pretty pivotal to this whole process. Um, but financial risk carries rewards, right? And you can do the math on what this is worth. Right? You can do the math on risking your money and putting it in a stock, risking your money and lending it to a friend, or anything else. And you can come up with a very good quantitative solution. But personal risks, wanting to change careers, wanting to pursue a passion, wanting to pursue a side project, whatever it is, are more qualitative. And what that means is that you will have a tougher time valuing these decisions on paper. right? But what's important is, although I can't teach you how to value this, right? If you decide that you wish to become an artist, right? After your career in engineering, that's fantastic. And I completely support your decision to go do that. However, I can't help you value what that's worth to you. What I can help you do is I can help you plan for it personally, right? I can help you plan for it so that you do it with the minimum amount of financial risk, right? And you don't put, you know, your family to live on the street if you decide to be an artist and it doesn't take off for a little while, right? You're able to have a cushion and some opportunity to go do things. So that's a little just a side note on risk and kind of separating the two because it is important to separate the two. A lot of people see their passions as only financial risk or as only to be evaluated in some way, right? So throughout this kind of lesson, we'll try to do some exercises, some basic exercises that you can do on your own, right? So at this point, you're gonna to wanna to identify if you have a co-planner for your financial plan. Now, that doesn't have to be 100% of it, right? So for example, if you, know, you and your wife or you and your husband decide, or you and your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, you decide that you're going to be making a financial plan together, you don't have to decide on every single item together, right? You might want to buy a brand new BMW, right? Uh, your spouse or the person that you're planning with might want to buy a boat, right? So you don't have to agree on everything. What you have to agree is the process to getting there, right? And so this process is going to be important. So identify if you have a co-planner and identify what your family position is. Now I want you to do this not only in the immediate term, right? So don't only look at, okay, well, I don't have any kids right now and I'm not married. Okay, that's great. That's great that you've identified that. But think about your goals and think about where your life is headed. Think about whether or not you plan on getting married, right? Whether or not you plan on having kids. If so, how many, right? Start thinking about these things because they're going to make a difference in how you look at your financial plan because our, per our personal finance plan is not going to be not going to be just an instantaneous how do I get enough money to get launched tomorrow it's going to be an iterative process over time right and so you're going to need to know some of the factors that will be will be looking at in the future excuse me the next thing you want to look at is your health right your health is important this goes back to kind of bodily risk right so if your health is affecting your financial plan directly right now, which means that some health condition doesn't allow you to earn more income, right? Or work a certain number of hours or whatever it is, you need to note that and you need to work with that reality, right? Furthermore, your personal financial plan will also have some sort of insurance. And this is insurance against bodily harm, and insurance against injury and anything that can stop your income from coming in, right? And you're gonna to wanna to start thinking about how you can do something like that and what you're going to be insuring. Now, insurance doesn't have to be something you go and buy from the store, 
right? So you don't go, you know, you don't go to the insurance agent and say, hey, you know, I think uh, in in a year or two, my wife and I are planning to have kids. Uh, can you sell me insurance? Because they're not going to sell you. I mean, there's no insurance for that, right? You just have to put it in a savings account or put it away in some way, right? But your health is going to be an important an important piece of that. So furthermore, besides planning, right, and besides anything that's currently preventing you, you're going to want to look to the future. And that's why I said with kids, right, you're going to want to look to the future for your health. And this often requires you to take a pretty good look at what conditions you may have that are hereditary, right, what you're predisposed to, and things like that. And that's going to be very important, right? So. Take your current plan that we started working on and add any history of illnesses, anything that you think you should be planning for, anything that could get in your way, right? So if you work a job where you're regularly exposed to large doses of radiation, be realistic with yourself, right? You might not have 50 years on the job in great health, right? That's just the reality. If you work a job where you're physically required to lift extremely heavy things, that might expire someday, right? You might not be able to. So take a look at your health and make sure that it aligns with your financial goals. The next personal thing we're going to look at is career choices. Now your career choice is pretty important, right? Because it'll affect your financial plan because different careers make different amounts of money, right? So it'll affect your income directly, right? A dentist earns a different amount of income from a web developer and also a different amount of income from a doctor and, and so on and from a lawyer and from all the other professions out there, right? Whether or not you're working as a clerk at a store or you're managing your own business, whatever it is, your income is going to be decided by your choice in career, largely. It doesn't mean you're not limited to that income. Nobody's telling you that's all you're ever going to make, but that's, that's the limitation. And we'll talk about a good idea called income diversification. Right? We'll talk about how you make sure that you're not just relying on one source of income right? and you're reducing that risk, but that's to come. Okay, the second note is pretty important. Do not, if you have not selected a career yet, do not select your career based on income. Okay, so don't go about building a great financial plan how you're going to you know, have 25 boats and you know, 7 cars and 11 houses and 5 wives and whatever the hell you want to plan, okay? Do not plan all those things and then say, well, the only way for me to do this is if I'm Bill Gates, or the only way for me to do this is if I become a doctor, okay? And then you go out and you become a doctor to achieve that plan. Now, that may be, may be the right choice for some people, right? I'm not saying that that's definitely not, but for the majority of you, try to choose a career that you're interested in and passionate about because the reality is you have to do it for most of the day for like the next 40 years. All right, so if you hate it, it's going to suck. And if you're a doctor and you're constantly on call and you're putting in 80 hour weeks, you're not even gonna have time to be in two houses. Forget about 11 houses, right? So think about what you're planning, but don't, don't select your career based on just income, right? That should be a part of your consideration, but not the only thing, All right? So the most important part is that it reflects your reality. It reflects your reality. So this is very important, right? It's very easy to say, well, I'm taking these online courses to be a Java developer, and so I plan on getting hired. I'm going to have me making a totally different salary five years from now. Yeah, that's great. That's a great goal. Keep working towards that. But your financial plan doesn't care about your goal. It doesn't care about whether or not you think it's going to happen. Your financial plan should reflect reality. That's the most important piece, right? The next thing you're going to want to consider with your choice of career is your income predictability. So simply put, what that means is if you work in a sales position where you're paid entirely on commission, so for example, you're a real estate agent, right? Your income is not predictable. It doesn't come every two weeks directly deposited into your bank account for an exact amount, right? If you do work for a salary, that's income predictability and you're going to be able to look at that and say, okay, well, I know how much I'm going to make every month so I can plan one way, or I don't know how much I'm going to be making from month to month, so I need to plan around that, right? And so, this is the important thing about your career, right? Is most people, most people sell their labor, 
right? And this is done on the collective labor market, right? So for example, if there were 10,000 jobs and only 5,000 people, those 5,000 people would have great negotiating ability because the jobs need to be filled, but there's not enough people, right? If it's the other way around and there's 10,000 people and only 5,000 jobs, wages will decline because the job givers will have an opportunity to do it differently, right? And so you have to decide what happens, right? Because you sell your labor. If you sell your labor, right, you may want to become self-employed, right? You may want to be, go out and just work for yourself, right? You may also become unemployed, right? Now, many of you may have never been unemployed, right, after you've started working, but the reality is over the course of a 40-year career, right, the probability is at some point you will become unemployed, right? excuse me, and you want to diversify your source of income. So if you already sell your labor, you could choose to sell your labor to someone else, right? So you could choose to just have two jobs. That's a way to diversify. It's not a great way to diversify because of what we spoke about. The labor market still carries risk, right? And so it's not fantastic. But if you could sell your work to multiple people, if you could have income coming in from other sources, then you have a very different position in terms of your financial plan and your career choice. So as part of as part of kind of the exercises that we're doing, right, you're going to want to list your current career position, your dream choice of career, and then any education that needs to be undertaken and any steps that need to be undertaken to take to get there, right? Because Although a financial plan doesn't enable you to go and change careers, right? You still need different skills and so on and so forth. It can provide you with the financial resources and the peace of mind to go out and pursue something like that, right? So what that means is you could buy yourself some time to get the education that you need, and then you can get yourself an opportunity to go out and look for work or sell your skills or however it is that you decide to pursue this. Okay. The next thing to think about is your age. Your financial plan is going to vary depending on how old you are, right? Because your needs, your desires, and of course your priorities are going to change with age, right? Now I know many of you may be watching this and thinking, okay, yeah, but I love drinking and I'm just going to keep drinking the rest of my life or I love partying and I'll keep partying or I love working so I'll keep... The reality is that's going to change, right? If not, because of your desires, your physical body will force that to change eventually, right? Nothing is sustainable forever, right? And this will have a direct impact on your financial concerns. Hopefully by the time you're 75, you're not working anymore. If you're not working anymore, you still need a way to pay the bills, right? You still need a way to live. And so your financial concerns leading up to your retirement may be to put money away for retirement, specifically to have enough money to keep living. So we'll work through an analysis of different, of different life stages, right? And what we'll do is I'll give you a, a rough idea Oh, excuse me. I'll give you a rough idea of what other people, what other people, not necessarily you, but what other people consider to be important at different stages, right? And this makes sense because you can listen to some of the wisdom of other people. Now remember, we're taking their opinions and their situations out of context and leaving in only their age, right? So we don't know about their economic position, we don't know about anything else, but we do know that priorities change over time and so we can have some broad strokes, right? Because when you're planning 10, 20, 30 years in advance, very rarely are you going to stick to the plan for 30 years, right? Your plan is going to adjust, but by having an eye on the long term, Right? You're able to make decisions that help you in the future as well, in the near future as well as the distant future. Okay. Next. So, your risk tolerance as you age will decline. And the reason your risk tolerance will decline is because it becomes more difficult. It becomes more difficult to take risks because you have less time left in your life to recover 
from a bad risk, right? To recover from a bad result. The second thing is you may depend on your investment income and on everything else that you have in your wealth portfolio at that point to keep living and continue to, to support yourself without working, right? So this risk tolerance will start to go down and will evaluate how you start changing your opinions and how you start changing the different things that you do based on your adjusting risk tolerance. Next. All right, by the middle of your adulthood, right, you'll have more people to care for. All right. This isn't inevitable or by any means a rule, right? Some people have kids very early on, some people have, don't have kids, right? Some people have aging parents that can't care for themselves, some people have the opposite, right? But you'll also have more income. And because of that, your lifestyle will change. So your expectations will also change, right? Expectations will also change. Now, again, many of you may be thinking, as I once did when I was a little younger, that I could just eat cup noodles forever, right? The reality is that much sodium forever is not going to leave me in a very good shape to even survive past 30, right? So your expectations for what you consume on a regular basis are going to change. Right? And we'll talk about your consumption and how that affects your planning. You'll also need more protection. Right? You'll need more protection for certain things. So if you have kids, right? so let's imagine a scenario for protection. Let's say that you have two kids. Right? Let's draw two adorable little kids here. Right? So you have a, a boy and a girl. Right? And, then, and then there's you and you take care of your kids, right? So your income is paying for their school and their ability to live and so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> and you didn't consider protection, you were just living your life as though you were living your life, everything was going fine, and then one day you wake up and you cross the street without looking and a bus hits you, okay? And the bus hits you and now you can no longer make an income, right? We won't go as drastic as saying that you're dead, maybe you survived, but you can no longer make an income in your current capacity. What you need is insurance in a case, in a situation like that. And so you'll start looking more and more on how to protect the things that you already enjoy and that you already have, rather than how to make more, right? And then finally, in retirement, you'll spend less money, right? And you'll spend less money because your needs are lower, Right? You're probably not going out partying every day. If you are, you're retired at a good age and good for you. That's very important as well. Right? It, even when you're socializing, you're not spending that much. You're eating less. You have less dependents to care for. Your kids are probably out of the house and doing their own life. Right? Maybe some of them are helping you out. Right? And so you want to be able to live in financial security. Right now, some of that is done through Social Security, some of that is done through various government aid programs, right? But the reality is none of that is enough to sustain a lifestyle, right? All of that is enough only to kind of cover the basic needs and keep you alive, right? It's not enough to pay for medical insurance, it's not enough to pay for going out and doing things and activities and nursing homes and whatever care that you need at that point in your life, and so you're going to want to plan for retirement. now. As the demographics of, of Twitch and YouTube suggest, most of you are not at this point planning for retirement. And that's fine. That's fine. But you need to know that one day you will be. And so you need to be making decisions that can allow you to ease into that in the future, right? So let's, let's just review this section quickly just to make sure we all got the major points. And we've covered basically everything, right? So... Your personal circumstances are going to be influencing your financial plan, right? Your personal circumstances. This includes family structure, family, health, career, and age. Obviously, it includes other factors, right? If you live in a place that's ample with opportunity and you can change jobs and do different things, that's fantastic, right? If you live in a place like that, great. But if you don't, you need to consider that. You need to think about it, right? These things, in turn, will affect your income needs and your tolerance for risk, right? They will, in turn, affect that. 
Now the stage of your life is also going to be very important because as we discussed, you're going to be going through life and your priorities and the things that you're thinking about and planning for are going to change. And then finally, right, making good financial decisions is a process of understanding, understanding your circumstances and goals. And we'll talk about the different ways that you can set goals and the different way that you can adjust to circumstances, right? And how exactly you can do that. Okay. Now we'll move on to the next step. So we looked at personal factors. Right? We looked at personal factors that are going to be important. There are also going to be systemic factors that influence your financial plans, whether you like it or not. Right? Almost no one is immune from systemic factors. As a matter of fact, usually the more wealth you have, the more exposed you are to systemic factors. Right? So it doesn't exist in a bubble. Right? It's not just you and your financial plan, right? As much as I'd like that to be the case, but then everyone would just write a financial plan that makes them trillions of dollars, and so inflation would go up and we'd have a bunch of problems, right? So that's just not the case. So economic factors are going to influence your decisions. And if you ignore them, you ignore them at your own peril. Right? Because as usual with economic factors, the sooner you know about them and the sooner you take corrective action to adjust your plans and adjust your decisions, the more effective you'll be at doing something like this. Right? The more effective you'll be at achieving your financial goals. First things first, you should be cons concerned with the current labor market. For the majority of us, we sell our labor either to individuals through some massive form to businesses or to companies, right? We sell our labor directly to those people, right? So we're going to be worried about that, right? So if unemployment is growing in your country, and it continues to grow, there's a good chance you may get laid off, right? If employment is growing in your country, that may be a good opportunity to switch careers or ask for a raise or do something else, right? So write down wherever you are on the planet, what is currently happening around you. And this is not only on a macro level, right? So it's tempting to say that in America, employment is growing. Okay, great. I'm very glad that in America, employment is growing. But what's going on in your town? What's going on in your city, right? When you're talking to people, are they having trouble finding jobs or are they finding them very easily? What's going on in your profession, right? Are all your software engineer friends finding jobs no problem and you're also a software engineer, right? Are all of your doctor friends having trouble finding jobs even though employment is growing, right? You're gonna wanna look at the details of your particular section within the labor market, right? So the, the broad strokes are important because that's important to watch and important to look for, but just as important is looking at the details of what's happening. Okay, so you should also be looking at the capital market, right? We'll talk about what capital markets are, right? And we'll talk about it in more detail when we get to spending, but capital markets, are composed of stock and bond markets. Okay, so in general, this will give you a pretty good understanding of the health of the economy, right? It'll give you a great understanding of exactly what's going on. So this gives you a chance to go ahead and look at, okay, well, you know, stocks are rising, which means people have more money to spend on investments and more excess income. The economy is doing well, right? Bonds are paying higher interest, the economy is growing, right? And that's a good opportunity. 
And so you want to take advantage of this opportunity, not only in your financial plan, but in your day-to-day -day life, right? And finally, you should be concerned with the store of value of your currency. And your concern here is predominantly with inflation. Right? So in the situation of inflation, you may have $5, right? And today you can go out and buy two loaves of bread with $5, right? If there's inflation in your country, next year you may need $6 to buy two loaves of bread, right? And so your money is storing value over time, but inefficiently, right? It's losing some value over time. And that's going to directly influence your buying power. And so if your buying power is slowly deteriorating, you need to find ways to combat this, right? You can't always have income that goes in line with inflation, right? That often doesn't happen. But your buying power needs to start increasing, right? And the way you, you increase your buying power is by looking at investments and trying to move your money somewhere where it's hedged against inflation. Now, it's okay if you've never been, uh, you know, if you've never checked financial news or done anything like that, that's totally understandable, right? But the reality is we will learn all of these things together and learn how to leverage these tools to get a better understanding. Let me just see if there are any questions on the chat. Okay, well, somebody, somebody's upset. Okay, so um, never mind. Business cycles. Business cycles. Business cycles happen all the time, right? So you're going to constantly see that the economy is getting better and then getting worse and then getting better and then getting worse, right? And this will keep happening. Now, you may not have lived through a specific recession or anything like that, right? Um, but recessions will come and so will expansions. And over the course of your 40 year career, averages you'll probably experience about five recessions, right? So the way the economy's growth is measured is through GDP, which is gross domestic product, right? And gross domestic product is just the value of everything produced in an economy, right? Importantly, this excludes things that were produced in the past and then resold, right? So it's the value of everything new produced in an economy, right? So if the GDP of a country is increasing, right? That is what is known as an expansion. If it's decreasing, that is known as a contraction. And if it's decreasing for six months, that is known as a recession. Right? That is known as a recession. And so, you have the opportunity to take advantage of expansions and contractions and vary your financial plan to adopt to the, to adapt to these things right so the economy is cyclical right you'll always find that that's not that's not news right you'll always find that it's cyclical but how you adapt how you react and how you change your financial plan will decide how successful you are at achieving your goals right the next thing, we'll go back to the employment rate. We'll go back to the employment rate, right? So this is measured by the number of people actively looking for work. Right, so if someone has stopped looking, they are no longer in this statistic. So when you look at unemployment and it says 5%, that means 5% of people are actively looking for work. Right? If another 10% have given up, those 10% are not included in that statistic. And so know that the employment rate can be a little bit misleading, right? And so your employment will also change with business cycles. Right? It will change throughout business cycles. So during expansions, employees 
have an opportunity to renegotiate and get better terms. During contractions, employers will often fire, you know, or lay off employees and then find new ones, right? And so therefore, you want to be able to work these things into your financial plan, especially if you sell labor, right? If your primary source of income is the sale of your labor, you're going to want to work within these cycles in order to maximize how much you're making and get what you're worth. Right? Remember that you are selling your labor actively every single day. And so if one day your labor becomes more expensive and more valuable, you should retain some of that, if not all of that benefit. Right? On the other hand, if in fact it doesn't happen, right, then you will be in a situation where your labor may be too expensive. Right? And so you may be laid off or the company may be contracted. Right? And so you need to have a contingent plan for that as well. Right? There are also other indicators of economic health that you can keep an eye on. Right? Now remember, depending on where you're from and where you're watching from, not all economic factors are very transparent or well gathered or well organized. Right? In general, you're going to be able to rely on them right? and you're going to develop over time a kind of intuition for what's happening based on what's going on around you. Right? If you don't live in a bubble, then that's going to happen pretty pretty often, right? So some of the things that indicate economic health are houses being built, and this tends to be good if there's more and bad if there's less, right? So if more houses are being built, then in general the economy is doing well and, and people are buying new homes, right? Also existing home sales, right? This is an interesting one. Right? Because if people are selling their homes in mass, that may mean that people are liquefying their assets. They're making them more liquid. And so if they're making them more liquid, you may have an opportunity. Oh, there goes another piece. I've got a whole collection of chalk there. Um, you may be encountering a situation where actually we're contracting, right? And people are selling their homes, but those homes aren't closing, right? So that's an important one to, to watch. Also, orders of durable goods. Right, and I'll just call that durable goods. And these are things like washing machines and cars, right? Things people tend to buy with the long term in mind, and they tend to be pretty expensive, right? You tend to need to finance them if you do buy them, but if people are buying durable goods, that means in general the economy is doing well and people are securing themselves for the future, right? And then finally, you want to look at consumer confidence, right? which is a general indicator of how confident people are that they're going to be able to sell, sell their labor in the future and be able to keep making income due to their spending, right? And in particular, one of the things that we tend to look at very closely is holiday spending because holiday spending tends to be at an all-time high and it's nice to compare over time, right? Now, it, it, that doesn't mean that you need to take each one of these into consideration every time you do your financial plan, right? But all of these things are worked into employment and GDP, right? So you can imagine if more houses are being built, more people are employed and GDP is rising, right? If consumers are confident, more people are needed to staff stores and ship products and move them around and GDP keeps growing, right? So this is an important piece to consider when you're thinking about your financial plans. The next factor we're going to go over is your currency, right? Or the value of currency. The value of currency. And so the value and usefulness of your currency is based on one thing and one thing only. Trade. If you can trade your currency for a house, worth that much. If you can trade your currency for a loaf of bread, it's worth that much. Whatever you are able to trade your currency for is its current value. And so if there's inflation and your purchasing power decreases, you're able to trade the same amount of currency for less things. Right? And that's something that you need to be concerned about, especially if your tendency is to earn money, have excess wealth, right? have excess income, and then put it all on a mattress, right? Because it's deteriorating over time, although it physically stays very good, 
right? Now, in general, you can expect consistent inflation, right? You can expect consistent inflation in the economy. So there will be more and more money and your currency will deteriorate over time at some specific rate, right? You don't want it to be too high or too low, right? And the reason is because there needs to be more money to accommodate all the new people and to accommodate all the new ideas. Right? So if we had a set fixed amount of money and somebody had a new idea, we'd necessarily need to destroy some old idea first before we could implement it. Right? And new people would be dividing up less and less wealth amongst themselves. And so inflation is going to be a constant that you're going to run into. Well, it looks like part of my eraser got wet. Okay, right, we'll try to work around that. Just a little bit. And we'll try to put my eraser somewhere where it can stay dry. Okay, so give me just one second just to make sure the board is usable. And we'll move on to our next factor. So the reason, the reason that you consider all of these externalities is because they're going to affect your financial plan. They're going to affect the performance of your plans, right? So if you had plans to, you know, buy a brand new yacht because you expected things to keep going as well as they did and then we hit an economic downturn, your plans are going to have to change because if you do buy that brand new yacht, even though there's been a change, you're going to see some trouble, right? So that's your currency value. Most commonly, the way you'll see currency valued is through CPI, right? at least in the United States, right? which is called the consumer price index. And what that is, is it's a basket of goods, right? I'm terrible at drawing baskets, but you can imagine that that's a basket, okay? And in that basket are all the goods that the average family buys, food and a car and a house and all of these things throughout a year, right? A washing machine, right? And so this basket costs $100. Right? And every year it's reset back to $100. Okay? It's reset back to that set amount. But if we look at the basket from the previous year, and in order to buy it in year two, you need $104, that means we've experienced 4% inflation. Right? Your $100 now needs an additional $4 just to buy the same thing. Right? And so that's going to be the way you often look at it. Now, you may be thinking that, okay, well, you know, I mean, Dennis, you're in, you're in the United States, why aren't you just talking about the dollar, right? Well, first of all, your investments are going to become global, right? There's simply no reason for you to keep all your money tied to one currency, right? The second thing is that even if you tie all of your money to a single currency, even if you invest only in American companies and buy only American products and are totally isolated from the rest of the world, the companies themselves are global. And so those companies will transact in foreign currency very often. And that will affect how you're doing. Now think about it, right? If there's rapid inflation abroad, let's say in China, and they ship goods to the United States, right? We may be able to buy more goods for less money and so the goods will cost you less in dollars right and if the opposite is true the, the goods will cost you more if there's inflation in the united states and we import wine from france and wine has and excuse me wine and france has lower inflation than we do then we will end up paying more money for the same goods right now so final note it's completely normal completely normal to expect things not to change. There are a huge amount of people that are paid exorbitant amounts of money to manage finances and manage personal wealth that expect things not to change. Okay, So it's normal if you expect things not to change. However, Nothing could be further from the truth, right? Change is going to be the only constant throughout this process, right? So throughout this process, you're going to be changing your financial plan. 
the external circumstances around you will keep on changing. They'll keep on evolving, right? You'll start to notice some patterns about what happens before something, what happens after something, how you can do it, right? And so you will need the tools to plan to take advantage of this change, right? If change is a constant, that there's nothing we can do about it, right? So we have no control over the change. What we can control is how we respond to the change. Our response to the change will result either in us achieving our financial goals or not achieving them. Okay, so as a review of systemic factors, let's see what we've covered. So business cycles will keep happening and they include expansions and contractions. So an economy is unsustainable if it's growing too fast or too slow. It needs to be somewhere in the middle. And so it would always tend to somewhere in the middle. If it speeds up too fast, it'll slow down drastically. If it slows down too much, it'll speed up drastically, right? GDP, and GDP is going to be your measure of wealth and economic health for the country in which you operate on a regular basis, right? This combined with CPI, which will measure the stability of your currency, will decide how the economic factors look in the near present. Right? So if GDP is growing drastically, but so is the CPI, and so is your inflation and amount of currency, there's actually nothing here happening. Right? So if GDP is growing at 10%, but the money supply is also growing at 10%, that's a net growth of zero. Right? What we expect is we expect GDP to outpace CPI by some degree. Right? But you'll find that that's not always the case. And when it's not the case, it's important that you adjust what you're doing. So we'll be looking at economic factors and all of these things as we conduct our financial plan. Right? Next we move on. Oh, excuse me. Next we move on to the planning process. Right? So now you know all of your external and your internal factors, right? And you know where you're headed. So we have a financial process, right? Or the process for actually planning for your financial goals and how you're going to do. Right? So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to define your goals. Right? We'll talk about a little bit how to define your goals and we'll talk about the different tools, but you need to know that you need to define your goals. Right? You then need to assess your situation. You need to assess your situation. Once you've assessed your current situation, you'll be able to identify your choices. Right? You'll be able to identify your choices. Your choices, right, will then each need to be evaluated. Right? And we'll talk about how to evaluate them in this section, right? But they'll need to be evaluated. And once they're evaluated, you're going to make a choice. Right? Now you're periodically going to adjust your goals, right? And then you're going to continue to reiterate this process over and over again, reflecting on your past choices, reflecting on the impact that they've had towards your goals, how your goals have changed and how that's changed the overall situation. But the important thing to remember is that this is a continuous process. 
you're going to be doing this over the course of a lifetime. And so it's important for you to understand that you're not going to get good at it right away. It's not going to be perfect. And the process is all about the learning, right? The learning and how to make better choices and how to evaluate better choices, right? And how to make decisions faster and how to define your goals more effectively. And we'll cover some of the basics to give you kind of a running head start so that you're not reinventing the wheel on these steps. All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to define goals. You're going to define goals. And you're going to do this regularly, right? So you're going to have short-term goals. And these will encompass somewhere between one to two years. Right? You're going to have intermediate goals. Anything from two to ten years. And then you're going to have long-term goals. And these are going to be anything over 10 years to plan, right? Now, your short-term goals are going to change because they expire quickly. But once you've set them, they're not going to change very often. Moving down to intermediate, because they take longer to achieve and to see to fruition, you're going to have to adjust them more often, even if you're not making progress towards them, because your lifestyle and your thinking and your priorities are going to change. And then your long-term goals will change often. Right? You'll actually find that you can set some pretty basic ones, like having the money to retire and so on and so forth, but that you'll need to keep adjusting for things like cost of living and so on and so forth. And so although your long-term goals may be constant right, in terms of their actual objective, what you'll find is that the thing that you're doing is you're adjusting the details of those goals over time. Right? So in the process of defining your goals, In the process of defining your goals, you are going to use the SMART method. Right? Now you can use any other method that you believe is good, but I found this one to work and a lot of people have, have recommended it as very good. And so when you set your goals, you're going to want them to be specific. Right? Not I want to buy a car. Which car? How much does it cost? What model? Right? How, you know, how much, how will you buy it? Will you finance it? How will you do it? And so on and so forth. They want to be measurable. Again, if I want to buy a car, right? I can buy a car for a hundred bucks that doesn't run. I can buy a car for two and a half million dollars if there's only like three of on the planet. I can buy an antique car, right? But if I want to buy, for example, a Toyota Camry, I can look up at any price, a brand new Toyota Camry, what the price is. And so that goal is measurable, right? You also want it to be attainable. If I'm currently buried in debt and don't have enough income to even cover what I'm doing, having a goal to buy a, a, uh, a jet is going to be an unattainable goal, right? Unless there's some windfall of lottery or something else. And so if you believe that to be attainable, then your financial plan should include regularly going to Vegas and gambling away all your income for the chance to buy a jet, right? They also have to be realistic. This doesn't mean sell yourself short, right? A lot of people think, okay, well, my goal has to be realistic, so uh, I'll buy a cheap car. No, yeah, you don't have to sell yourself short. You can be ambitious, right? But be realistic. Buying five jets probably isn't very realistic, right? And then you want them to be timely, right? You want them to be timely in the sense that you want to be able to say that I want to buy this in five years, right? I want to achieve this in 10 years. And your plan has to support the time that you've chosen, right? So if your plan is to save up all your excess income, right? Let's say that's $10 a year, right? To buy a car in five years, you're going to buy a $100 car, right? If your plan is to save your excess income of 10000 a year and buy a car in five years all cash, you're going to buy a car for 50000 If you plan on using leverage, this will be even higher, right? So. That's how you're going to want to set your goals. You're going to be smart. Now, your goals will change. So if you're just graduating, for example, you may want to reduce your debt. Right? So you may want to pay off all your college debt and you want to kind of make sure that that's there and that you have that taken care of. Right? 
assuming that you are in debt for college. You might not be in debt for college. Right? The next step, usually, after doing that, is to accumulate some assets. Accumulate some things that make your life easier and make earning more money an easier thing to do. Right? So you accumulate assets. Right? And then finally, you'll want to create retirement income. Right? Now these are extremely broad strokes. Right? There's, I mean, there's basically only three steps. Right? And that's your entire life. Right? So maybe this is your 20s. This is like 30 to 60, right? And then this is 60 plus, right? So you might want to think about all these things, but you might want to start planning for retirement income very early because as we're going to see, if you start saving earlier, you're able to put away more money, right? And you're able to earn more interest on your earnings. And we'll talk about the different ways to diversify and make positive, positive impacts on your life, right? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at Assessing your situation, right? So we're going to be assessing your situation. So in order to assess your situation, right, you're going to have to be honest with yourself, right? That's going to be the first step. Just be honest with yourself. You're not presenting this in front of a class. Nobody's judging you, right? Be honest with yourself because you've already taken a positive step in the right direction. Right? If you start with honesty, you already know you've taken a positive step towards the future, and so you've actually done something very good. Right? Everything you've done in the past, we'll discuss, but everything you've done in the past is, well, in the past. Right? So you'll need to clearly organize different aspects of your financial life. Right? You need to organize things like your assets. So if you have a car, right, or if you have a house, or anything that can be traded for liquidity or for cash, on a pretty quick basis, those are your assets, right? You're gonna to wanna to think about your debts, anything you owe, things like student loans, car loans, mortgages, credit cards, right? You're also gonna to wanna to think about your income. If you just started a job and you're making 30K a year, then you're gonna to have to put that down, right? And then you're gonna talk about your expenses, right? And your expenses are directly related to supporting your income. Right? So in order to go and make an income, you have to put on clothes, right? And you have to go and take a shower, and you probably have to live in a house of some sort, right? So you have expenses related to getting your income, and so you're gonna wanna jot that down, right? We're gonna learn how to then take all this and organize it into three financial statements, right? The first financial statement will be, excuse me, an income statement. The second financial statement will be a balance sheet, right? So a balance sheet will contain your assets and your debts. Your income statement will contain your income and expenses. And then finally, you'll have a cash flow statement. And now although that may include your income and expenses, it will also include any other windfalls of cash that you have, for example, from selling an asset or from borrowing money, right? So the way this looks is the following. The way this looks is the following, right? So you might have after-tax income, and I'll keep the numbers extremely simple, right? But you might have after-tax income of 10,000, okay? Your rent is 2,000. Your living expenses, right? So this is a positive, this is a negative. Your living expenses are another 2,000, okay? Then, you're also paying off your debt. And you happen to be very in debt in this situation, right? So let's say you're paying 5,000 towards your debt, right? You're get, trying to get out of debt quickly, that's your goal, right? And so you have a remaining 1,000, right? And this 1,000 is available for savings. It's available for you to be able to do something with it. Now, when you look at something like this and you're able to expose your financial position, right, you'll begin to understand not only where your money goes and how much of it is left, but the best way for you to attain your goals, right? So if your current living expenses are 2,000, but 1,000 of that is actually caramel lattes, 
right? You may cut out caramel lattes and reduce your debt at 6000 a month instead of 5000 Rather than saving and earning less money than you're paying in interest, you might want to put this 1000 back into here, right? Or on the contrary, your goal may be to have a rainy day fund because you're worried about your job prospects because the economy is not that great. And in that situation, you take the debt, you reduce the amount that you're paying, and you start saving a little more. And each of these things are choices that you can make based on the information that you see and everything else that you've put in front of yourself. The next thing you'll do is evaluating and making choices. Now this is perhaps the most important thing. Anybody, any person, your family member, your friends, your cousin, I don't know, whoever, your cat, whoever you ask for financial advice, myself, right, your professor, your loan officer, anybody that tells you what you should do with your finances without finding out your goals doesn't have your best interests in mind. They don't. Because what you do with your finances should sure serve your goals, right? It should cover your goals because that's what's important. What's important is that you are serving and getting to your goals and using your finances as a way to get there, as a way to enable you to live the life that you want, to own the things that you want, to have the freedom that you desire, to mitigate the risks that you desire, to care for the people that you love, right? And so the decisions that you make, the way you're going to evaluate them is you're going to evaluate them individually based on how they serve your particular goals, not someone else's, yours. And that's very, very, very important, right? So you're going to want to kind of figure out short-term choices, short-term choices. And on the other side, you're going to want to figure out long-term strategy. Long-term strategy. Now, over time, right, as many of you will know, that your long-term strategy is actually composed of a series of short-term choices. Right? But by knowing your direction and where you're headed and what you want to attain, right? So let's say you want to attain income security, right? Let's say you want to make sure that no matter which of your income sources falls through tomorrow, you have enough income to survive on a regular basis without picking up more work, right? That's your long-term strategy. Your long-term strategy is to get there. Your short-term choices will serve your long-term strategy. All right. So... Like I wrote down in my notes, this seems like a good time to mention that the plan is meant to support everything else you're doing, right? And I'm glad I actually had the same thought when I was going through it. You should understand that money and financial planning are your servants, right? They are your servants, and you should treat them as such. They are tools for you to get to where you want to go. You do not serve your money in your financial planning. They serve you. So once you understand your current situation, you'll start evaluating choices, right? So here's a framework that you can consider, right? You can think about costs and benefits. Now, Benjamin Franklin had kind of the best way of thinking about this, and this is perhaps the simplest way, right? So, you take a T-chart, you on one side, you write down the costs, right? The costs of doing something or not doing it, and the benefits, right? And then you see how many things are here, and how many things are here. And you start to think, okay, well, I think these two things are pretty much equivalent. These two are pretty much equivalent. This one is really big, so maybe it equals two of these, right? This one equals two of these, and so I'm left with overall more costs than benefits, right? And you start working through that process and understanding, and this will be based largely on your values, right? If you value spending time with your family and your goal is to have a very high income, perhaps adding a second job is not the way to go. Perhaps you need continuing education or something like that. Okay, now, you'll also want to consider, besides costs and benefits, you'll want to consider risk, right? And risk is pretty important. Um, basically, the way you're going to think about risks is if you take a risk, right, and the risk doesn't work, if the risk doesn't work or if it does work, right, so there's kind of a positive aspect and a negative aspect to the risk, right, where does it leave you? 
I don't even know how to represent that visually. You are here. Right? So if you take the risk and you succeed, you're better off. Great. And if you fail, you're worse off, right? What you want to try to maximize is you want to try to maximize your future decisions. Right? So some time ago, I remember reading an article, right? And we were talking about strategy here, so this is, I guess, kind of relevant. But you want to maximize your future decisions, your ability to make different future decisions. Because the more decisions you can make, the more choices that you have in the future, the more likely you are to have good choices, right? And the more likely you are to be able to make them. Right? And so I read an article not too long ago about how artificial intelligence in one of its simplest forms wins a chess. And the way it wins a chess isn't by having a bunch of memorized moves or making a bunch of direct or, or you know, pre-programmed decisions. Instead, it maximizes choices. Right? It simply looks to make the move that leaves it in the best position to make the most possible choices next time. Right? Because it's able to evaluate those choices so quickly it has an advantage. And so as your financial planning skills get better, think of it as training your artificial intelligence, your ability to make choices on the spot based on what you're observing in your finances. And the more you think through this process, the more times you do it, the further ahead you'll be able to think. Right? The further ahead you'll be able to decide that I can do so and so and that's an appropriate risk, or I can't do so and so because it's not an appropriate risk, right? It doesn't actually have the payoff that I want. All right, so one of the kind of good illustrations of risk is the following, right? So let's say you need additional income to pay down your debt, right? So let's say you have some debt, right? And you're currently here. Now, you have two choices. You can either get a second job and put away money to pay down your debt. Or you can take all of your savings and go to Vegas, right? And if you win, you get to pay off your debt. Great, right? I mean, Vegas seems like a much better alternative because I mean, if you lose, you can just go back to square one and get a second job. Right? And this of course is why Vegas is appealing, right? But you have to weigh the risks. Right? The probability of you actually being able to pay off your debt on one trip to Vegas with all your savings is something like 1%. Right? And it's probably actually lower than that. But the odds that you'll be able to pay it off with your second job are 100%. Right? So now when you look at these risks and you understand that you'll end up at that second job anyway, except you'll be something like one or two years behind on income, right? suddenly Vegas doesn't seem like such a good idea for paying off debt. Still might be a good idea if you want to go catch a good show or something like that, right? So it's important to consider when you're considering risk that not all risk is equal, right? Not all risk is the same and not all payoffs are equal and not all probabilities are equal, right? So risk should be factored in as a cost, right? That's what's important here. So let's do a quick review here of what we just covered just to make sure that everybody is up to date. So financial pl planning is a recursive process. It's a recursive process. Okay? So you'll be defining goals, assessing your situation, coming up with choices, evaluating them, and then making them. And then you'll be circling right back to setting your goals again, right? Your goals are going to be shaped by your current expected circumstances, your current and expected circumstances. And expected circumstances are going to shape your goals. Right? And that's very important because as your current and expected circumstances change, your goals will as well, right? This will affect goals that are short term, goals that are medium term, and of course goals that are long term, right? And then finally, your choices will allow for faster or slower progress towards your goals. 
And this is why goal setting is so important, is because if we didn't start with goal setting and you just chose to be faster, right, and chose your goal later, going faster in the wrong direction is t much more detrimental than going slowly in the wrong direction because at least you have time to turn back. Right? Going faster in the wrong direction means you have to turn back and cover all that ground again. And so knowing which direction you're headed towards is going to greatly inform your decisions. I feel like my paper towel is working better than the... Uh... Oh, one more item for review that I missed is you should evaluate choices and think about benefits, explicit costs, implicit costs, and finally your strategic costs. So we actually missed one of these, so I'm glad I went over this, right? But the benefits are what you get, right? That's what you get, that's what you're actually trading, right? So you give money, you get something, you give something, you get money, right? That's your benefit. That's pretty straightforward. Your explicit costs are just how much things cost, right? The risk and everything else is that's baked in there. Your strategic costs are going to be where you end up at the end of the situation, right? If you had to make a choice between, for example, buying shoes and buying a jacket, your strategic cost is that you end up with a jacket and no shoes, or shoes and no jacket, right? But what's important here is that we discover actually, or that we look into implicit costs, right? And so I'm glad that we did the review because I missed that earlier. So your implicit costs are going to consist of the following, right? Your implicit costs are going to consist of one, sunk costs, and sunk costs are going to be anything you've already done. Okay, so if you chose the shoes over the jacket, you've already done it, there's no going back, right? So even if it rains terribly tomorrow or it's very cold and dry, you have the shoes, you don't have the jacket, right? Those are your sunk costs. And those are going to be the things you went through, learn from them, right? Learn from them. If you have sunk costs, it's probably because you have regrets. And if you have regrets, learn from them and don't make those mistakes again, right? Or make choices differently. Try to inform your choices differently, right? So maybe before deciding whether or not you buy shoes or a jacket, check the weather for the next week, right? See what it's going to be like. The second thing is opportunity cost. And this is important, right? Because let's say the shoes are $100. And the jacket is also $100. Now when you go into the store and you have $100 and you make a decision, right? So let's say we chose the shoes. You're giving up the $100, right? But you're also giving up the opportunity to have a jacket. So had you held on to the $100 and waited a day until to see if it's raining or cold, you could have decided which one you want. Right? But today you're giving up the opportunity to have the jacket. And so opportunity costs are very important. And they're much more important not only when it comes to just your money, but also when it comes to your time. Right? If you commit 80 hours a week to your employer, you're not going to have much opportunity to do anything else. And if you don't have much opportunity to do anything else, you're going to be in a situation where you need to change that. Right? You need to change something. So, all right. The next thing. is financial advice. Okay, financial advice is pretty short, but it's important to cover. So financial advice. Right? So no doubt after completing, completing the course you'll feel empowered to go do something about your finances and you'll be planning them and improving them and making decisions. Right. However along the way the complexity will increase. Right? There will be more and more complexity as you do this, right? Assuming you're doing it correctly and you are achieving your goals, your new goals are going to be more complex, more interesting, more difficult to achieve, right? And so you may need to seek help, right? You may need help. And so when you seek help, there's going to be a litany of professionals that can tell you how to spend your money, right? Everyone from your cousin and your uncle suddenly becomes a financial advisor, right? Um, your dad and your grandpa are also great financial advisors all of a sudden, right? And the guy that works at your local branch and the person you meet in the grocery store, basically anyone that you tell that you have this complex situation will give you some sort of advice 
on what you should do. Okay, and so it's important to understand how you can work with that advice, right? So some of them are going to be accountants, right? And they're probably good to consult for tax purposes and so on and so forth. Some of them are going to be investment advisors, right? Other people are going to be estate planners. Estate planners and insurance agents. And there's going to be a litany of people there's going to be a huge group of people that all have these different certifications and different backgrounds and different experiences and so on and so forth that are going to be available to help you, right? So there's a couple of things that you need to understand before you take financial advice from anyone, right? And the following things are extremely important, right? First of all, you want to understand their training, right? You want to understand what they're trained in. So if you go to your insurance person and they're trained in providing insurance, and you ask them about whether or not you should buy Tesla stock, and they tell you, yeah, sure, that's not a great person to be taking that advice from, right? They're trained in insurance. You can listen to them on insurance, but make sure that they have your best interests in mind, right? Also know how they're compensated. If your insurance agent gets paid on the amount of money that you pay the company a month and the size of your insurance policy, you can damn well bet they're going to try to get you a very expensive insurance policy, right? Here, you're going to want to, for the most part, find people that are going to charge you money per hour, right? They're going to charge you per hour and you're going to pay them the 300 or 350 or whatever it is that they decide their hourly rate is. And you're gonna to wanna to find people compensated like that. People compensated on selling you products do not have your best interests at heart. They have their own best interests at heart, which is perfectly natural, and they're not to be blamed for that. That's just how the system works, right? So be wary of how they're compensated, right? And then finally, diversify your sources of information. So go ahead, ask your grandpa about whether or not Tesla stock is good, right? Ask your uncle about whether or not putting money in an IRA is a good idea. Ask your neighbor. Ask your financial planner. Ask your accountant, right? Ask different people. But always consider how they're compensated and how they're trained and where their expertise lie before you rely on them. Okay. So now we're going to move on to some basic ideas of finance. And these are, once again, these are going to be critical, absolutely critical to your success basic ideas of finance. These are going to be critical to your success because it's important to understand them if you're going to be doing financial planning, right? If we were doing party planning, we'd have to know the basic ideas of parties. Right? So Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations says, money, says the proverb, makes money. When you have got a little, it's often easy to get more. The great difficulty is in getting that little. Right? And so we're going to be getting that little. And it is true that once you have a little money, it's often easier to keep making money. Right? But how do you get to having that little? Right? So personal finance addresses the great difficulty of getting that little bit of money that you need in order to grow, right? We'll learn things like how to manage income and wealth. Manage income and wealth, right? Um, in order to hopefully satisfy your desires, satisfy your desires, right? And increase your income and increase your wealth and increase both, right? That's kind of the gold standard. So if you're able to have your income and your wealth work for you not only to satisfy your desires, but also to increase your future income and your future wealth, you found a very good situation. And we're going to talk about how to get into that situation and how to keep it there by setting your financial goals and by planning correctly, right? So the idea of creating more wealth rests with having productive assets. Right. So these productive assets are going to be generating income, right? So they're going to be generating income of some sort. Um, more than likely, they'll be generating either dividends, interest, right? So you'd receive dividends from stocks. You'd receive interest by lending money, right? 
and then you would receive, um, excuse me, rent by owning property and renting that out, right? And so all of your wealth is going to hopefully produce some form of income because the way the economy works is if you own something, you're able to borrow money or borrow liquidity and sell away pieces of future income. Um, okay, so what's important here is that fi finance subjects can be not even on the dry side. They can be difficult to grasp immediately, right? They can be quite challenging to grasp and quite challenging to understand. But the goal isn't to learn it right away. The goal is to learn it over time, first of all. And second of all, and perhaps most importantly, the better you understand how the economy works, the better you understand, the more likely you are to, to achieve, to meet your goals. The more likely you are to meet goals. Right? And this is an important piece. This is extremely important because understanding how the economy works will enable you to create things that generate wealth for you, that give you better opportunities. Right? So, having said that, the best plans fail, right? And that's fine, right? We don't expect all of our plans to succeed. What we expect is to know what to do, know what to do when it happens, right? We can actually expect with reasonable certainty that this will happen, and when it does happen, we want to know what we should be doing, right? So let's begin with a simple question, or a seemingly simple question. of the source of income, or perhaps the question would be, where does income come from? And this is an important thing to consider, right? Because we're always really concerned about our income, right? But we don't often stop to think about where it's actually coming from, right? So income is, is just money received in a given period, right? That's, that's pretty straightforward. Right? So if you're an employee or self-employed, right? you're still an employee, you're going to be receiving a salary. That's going to be a source of income. Right? If you have a savings account of all kinds of different varieties, you're going to be receiving interest. Right? If you have stock, you'll be receiving dividends. And if you own property, you'll be receiving rent. Now this is pretty straightforward and understandable here, right? Uh, oh, in addition, if you're part of a partnership, right? So if you run a company with a few other people and you're all part of a partnership, you're also entitled to draw. So you're entitled to take your piece and your part of the earnings out of that company, right? Your investment into that company, out of that company at any point, right? Depending on your contract and stuff, but. Um, in general, you'll be able to do that. Right? So, there's two fundamental ways to earn income. Right? The two fundamental ways to earn income, excuse me, the two fundamental ways to earn income are selling labor and selling capital. Right? Selling capital is the reason that we call it capital markets, right? And so, when you sell labor, you're either working for yourself or for someone else, right? And your income isn't just your salary, it's your total compensation. So this includes stuff like retirement contributions, health care, um, and a litany of other benefits, sick days, all of that is included as part of selling your labor and part of your salary. Furthermore, your labor is sold in the labor market, and so the conditions of the labor market are going to matter quite a bit, right? So if nobody's hiring and it's difficult to find a job and everybody is offering low, below average pay, you might have to take it because the way you earn income is you sell your, excuse me, you sell your labor, right? The other way is by selling capital. And when you sell capital, right, you take your excess cash, take your excess cash and you quite literally sell or rent it. Right? 
right? You sell or rent it to someone else who needs it, right? And the way this works, right? If 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 you could be a private arrangement, so you could just you know rent your capital to a friend. That's what lending is, right? You're taking your cash and you're renting it to a friend, right? And then your friend's giving it back to you with a little bit of interest on it, right? That's the rent you collect, right? Or you could sell it. You could buy a piece of a company like a stock or a share, right? And sell your cash in exchange for some future income or piece of what they're earning, right? Um, so buying a stock buys future value, right? And so it's important to start thinking about cash in this transactional way, right? The cash isn't just there to go back and forth and trade for goods, right? You can also trade cash and sell it and rent it, right? And that's very important, right? You can also rent it yourself if you wish to borrow. So there's many assets that you can invest in, obviously, right? These include like antiques. Uh, some people choose to invest in art or coins, uh, land, right? You can invest in things like commodities, like orange juice, right? And these are all going to be different investments with different characteristics. And we'll talk about the, the pros and cons of kind of each one. And, you know, they're going to depend. I mean, it, and commodities include things like soybeans and cattle and stuff like that but we'll talk about all the different characteristics of these investments um, and what exactly you're buying for your money but what's important whatever you choose to do what's important is that it can be sold later right and that it has some sort of appreciation right that you're able to sell it later for presumably more money or at least to receive income in the process in the form of dividends and get your money back right so that's not always the case right it should create future income and future wealth but that's not always the case and that's part of the risk that you evaluate you see it looks like there might be a question here how about a financial advisor that takes a portion of an investment revenue you know what let me jump to that I'm sorry I didn't see that question earlier um, okay so a financial advisor takes a portion of your revenue. Okay, so let's say uh, you are a 55-year-old uh, man. You've got um, your old man. You've got let's say two kids. Uh, your wife recently got laid off. Okay, and you have some excess cash, right? So your wife is not working. Right, and you have some excess cash, and you bring it to your investment advisor. Okay? So you bring it to your investment advisor and you say, well, I have this excess cash, can you invest it? Right? And your investment advisor says, okay, yeah, but I'll charge you a percentage of what I make. Okay? I'll charge you a percentage of what I make. Okay? And now your investment advisor takes your money and he's got a decision to make. Right? He's got a decision to make. He can put his money into some very safe debt that will produce... $50 per month guaranteed, right? Or he can put it into a risky stock in a developing nation of a company that is unproven, right? But that could, in one month, make $5,000. Where do you think he's going to put it if his compensation is a percentage? So here, he would be making, let's assume he gets 2%, he would be making $1, right? one dollar here he would be making 100 and the important thing is if this doesn't pan out and it fails he doesn't lose anything you're the one that ends up with the loss if this pans out he just gets his guaranteed dollar and so the incentive is for him to take more risk than you might bear right so that's an important thing that you're gonna have to line up on and you're gonna have to be able to control right now he can misstate the risk or he could misadvise you on the risk or make mistakes himself. So in general, unless you plan on taking very large amounts of risk and you want to compensate somebody to make as much money as possible, taking as much risk as possible, this is going to be an okay outcome. But if your plans are different and if your plans are safer, compensating them as a percentage of what you're making, if you're not planning to make very much but you want to do it safely, is not going to be good. What you can, however, do is you can arrange for what they do to be risk adjusted. Risk adjusted, right? 
So for example, this had a risk adjusted return of $50, right? Which means that no matter what went wrong or right, this would still pay $50, right? It had very, very low risk. Let's say these are government bonds, okay? But this had an adjusted value of $50 as well. Because although it could have made you 5,000, it could have lost you 49.50, right? And so the remaining, that's not actually how you do risk adjusted, but let's just say for the sake of this example, the risk adjusted value, and we'll discuss what that is, is $50, right? And so the compensation then would be the same for these two things, and he'd prefer to take the less risky option, right? But again, that might create a conflict of interest if you want him to take on more risk, right? So it's, it's a difficult line to, to walk across, it's a difficult thing to do. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, I'm sorry I got to it late. I just wasn't wasn't paying as much attention to the chat as I should be. Okay, so in your labor market, right, the price of labor is the wage that the employer is willing to pay. Willing to pay for your work, right? This is going to depend on a lot of things like we discussed, like your education and the labor supply and the labor demand, right? So if labor supply is high and demand is low, wages are going to go down. The other way, it might work the opposite, right? So if the labor supply is very, very low, but the demand is extremely high, wages will rise as employers compete for employees, right? Now, this isn't the only thing that should determine what you're doing, right? And the reason is people also gain, and when you're weighing jobs, people also gain intellectual, they gain social, and personal gratification and personal gratification by working, right? And so you should start weighing these things for yourself as well, right? So perhaps the job that you have is personally satisfying. You fly a plane. Perhaps the job that you have is socially satisfying. You're helping the world do something or achieve something, right? And maybe you don't make as much money, but the social satisfaction makes up for that. Or the intellectual satisfaction. Perhaps it allows you to learn and grow as a person. And you take put a great deal of value on that. Excuse me. Okay, so your position in that labor market is going to be very important. It's going to change over time, right? But for the most part, it'll be more or less predictable, right? So in the future, you'll be able to sell your labor for more. Assuming you haven't completely changed what you're doing, right? And if you have, you'll have to bear the consequences of doing that, right? So maybe before you sell your labor, right, it's for a different job, you might accumulate some assets and decide, okay, well, I have this side stream of income that's making up the difference between a pay cut that I'm going to take to do something that I love or something that I'm more interested in, right? And so in this situation, you can sell your labor for more over time, right? Because you gain experience and you're better at what you're doing, assuming that you're continuing to keep up with the skills, right? Now, in, in today's and current market, that might not be the case, right? And it might not be the case for long that you're able to keep doing this without continuously refreshing your skills and getting better at what you do, right? And so that's, that's your position in the labor market. In the capital markets, in the capital markets, right, the reason that they exist is so that buyers can buy capital, right? It's that simple. Now you, as a person with savings, are a source of capital. And as a source of capital, you get to choose how you sell your capital and you have a lot of choices. Whereas the buyers of capital basically can go to you or to a bank, right? They're limited on their choices in how they buy their capital. And so that gives you leverage and the ability to charge interest. Right? This is actually pretty important, right? That's how you take your excess cash and you buy things like stocks, bonds, right, mortgage securities, and you're able to increase both your income and your wealth by doing so. Now, for any particular investment, where's my, oh, sorry, ah, for any particular investment, There's going to be a market, right? There's going to be a market. There's going to be the general demand and supply, right? And so what you're going, going to want to look at, right? Typically, where the demand is highest 
and the supply is lowest is also going to be where the risk is the greatest, right? Now, if you find a situation where the supply is low, the demand is high, but the risk isn't being compensated for, as in there's less risk than the compensation allows, that is an absolute situation where you should buy, right? Now, if you find that the risk is not being compensated, as in the demand is extremely high, the supply of capital is extremely low, but the difference between them doesn't come close to compensating, that is a situation to short or not to buy, right? We'll talk about shorting stocks and some different financial options that you have, but that is a situation where you should not get involved because it's not a good place to sell your capital. Okay, so another th important thing to, d to note is that the more capital you have, the more places you can sell. So if you have $1,000, you can buy like one share of Apple, right? If you have $100,000, you might be able to buy some shares, you might be able to buy some bonds, you might be able to put some money in a savings account, you might be able to lend some money to a major corporation, lend some money to a friend, and so diversify your holdings and protect yourself, right? You may also get investment opportunities that require that someone invest a large amount of money up front, and so having a large amount of money may allow you to open up new investment sources and new opportunities that are more lucrative, right? But remember, everything that's more lucrative carries more risk. That's always the case, right? At the end of the day with financial instruments, the pricing should reflect the risk. This sometimes gets out of whack and you should pay attention for when that happens, but most of the time you're going to directly reflect risk. Okay, so we now we know where in income comes from, right? So then it's equally important to understand where does income go? What happens to income, right? So income will represent all your sources for money, right? All your sources that come in on at least a semi-regular basis, right? And then all of your expenses that you need to make that money, right? That's what your income is comprised of, right? So if you make $3,000 and it costs you $2,500 to maintain that, right? Your total income is about 500, right? If you're making $3,000 and it costs you 3,500, your income is negative 500. And that's an unsustainable situation and not a situation that you could be in for very long without going into bankruptcy. So, what is that called? So when your income is less than your expenses, right? You're in a budget deficit. You can get out of this situation by financing it with debt, right? The only problem is debt will subtract from your income because you have to pay interest, right? And so debt will make your income even lower, right? And so you're, you're kind of in this endless cycle of downward spirals. So financing budget deficits with debt is not recommended, right? And it's the reason a lot of people end up in bankruptcy. Now, if you have more income, what you have is a budget surplus. And on your budget surplus, you're able to have some money to put away to invest into wealth generating assets. Or basically, you have money left over that you can now sell, right? You can now sell that capital to someone else and hopefully supplement your income and change how you do things. Okay, so once, let's assume you have a budget, because there's not much to explore really in a budget deficit, you just add a deficit. But let's assume you have a surplus. Now, if you have a surplus, you have some choices for what you do with that money, right? You can put it in a piggy bank, which overall is not a great idea due to inflation, right? Or as a lot of people like to call it, under your mattress. Uh, you might just enjoy sleeping on cold, hard cash. And if that's your thing, then do that because that'll bring you some pleasure at least. But if you're not that type of person, then don't put it in a piggy bank, right? You can put it in an account that bears interest account with interest, right? So this is a savings account or something like that and you can earn interest on what you're doing, right? 
You can also put it in a CD or a certificate of deposit. So a certificate of deposit will require some minimum amount of cash, usually about $5,000, right? You'll put in the $5,000 and what you'll agree with the bank is that you're not going to touch that money for five years, right? And that in exchange, they're going to pay you interest on that money so that when you take it out in five years, you've taken out the principal plus the interest. So effectively what you're doing is you're lending the bank money, right? You can also buy government savings bonds. which, just like it sounds, is another way to lend the government money, right? Or you can put it in a money market account. Now, money markets account will usually have a higher threshold for what they require, and they'll usually reward you for reaching that threshold. So whether it's 10,000 or 50,000 or $100,000, a money market account will allow you to make withdrawals from time to time Right? They'll make sure that you don't fall below a certain amount, and in exchange, they'll give you an interest rate. Right? So this is, these are some of the things that you have access to. Right? And this is just the baseline. You can also obviously get stocks and bonds, and we'll talk about that. But your immediate surplus can be divided up in the following ways. Right? Okay. So let's review. Let's review. So it's important It's important to understand your sources of income, excuse me, I just got lost on the page. Your sources of income and expenses. And whether or not you're in a budget surplus or deficit because that's going to inform a lot of your short-term goals, right? If you're in a budget deficit, then you need to get out of a budget deficit. If you're in a budget surplus, then you need to figure out what to do with that extra money, right? Your wages or salary, wages are come from employment, right? I won't write it out, but interest comes from lending, right? Rent comes from property. Dividends come from ownership in a stock or a bond, right? Or excuse me, just in a stock. Oh, and draw comes from partnerships. I always forget draw. And draw comes from partnerships. I've actually never been part of a partnership, so I uh, I don't have it in my in my in the back of my head as experience. Furthermore, you need to address deficits and surpluses, right? So if you have a surplus and you're not doing something with it, you need to address it and rather quickly, right? You don't want it to just sit around as a surplus indefinitely and just accumulate somewhere in your house, right? Where you just have stacks of $100 bills. That's not a great idea, right? You have a massive surplus. So figure out what you can do with your surplus and figure out what you can do with it rather quickly because it needs to be earning you more money or becoming more productive. Right? So some of the ways to deal with a deficit is you're going to be increasing income. Increasing income. Right? That might be hard to do unless you find a second job immediately. Right? You can reduce expenses. Again, not an option for everybody, but something that if you look at it closely, you might be able to do with the right things. Or you can borrow, right? And and, and borrowing should be kind of a last resort uh, because you that I mean this just leads to a downward situation right um, and then finally if you have a surplus you can spend more you can save more right or you can invest right and so you know you may choose to do those things in some proportion over time right so you may choose to save more when you're younger and have less things to spend on right you may choose to spend more and invest more for your middle age because you're worrying about retirement and stuff like that and then you may choose to just be spending and leaving all your money in investment and not saving as much in your retirement because time is running out if you've got it you might as well use it okay so that's where you're at and that's your income and expenses the next thing we're going to talk about is assets
And when we talk about assets, right, an asset is anything of economic value that you can convert into cash. Right? So if you can't convert it into cash, it's a possession. Right? It's just a possession. If, I mean, if you have a lamp and you can run a garage sale and sell it for a dollar, that has, that's an asset that has an economic value. If no one would buy it for a dollar or you'd have to pay somebody to take it away from you, that's just a possession. It's not an asset. Right? So things like your car, your savings account, any stocks that you own, any land or a house that you own, right? These are all going to be assets. These are all going to be assets, right? So when you sell your excess capital, you're hopefully in the capital markets, right? You're hopefully going to exchange it for some asset, right? And that asset is going to store your wealth, right? Or your goal is for it to store your wealth and for it to generate income. Right now, depending on the asset, you're going to take more or less of one of these, right? So some things are going to store your wealth extremely well and generate very little income. Some things are going to generate a lot of income but not store your wealth, right? Some things are going to do both haphazardly. Some things are going to do both extremely well but at an extremely high failure rate, right? So they might do it when, they, when it works, it works great. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And so we'll learn about how to evaluate those different decisions, right? So. Essentially what you're trading, what's important to understand is you're trading and you're giving up liquidity. And liquidity has a value, right? When you give up liquidity, when you give up your cash and you sell it in the capital markets for some investment asset, right? You're giving up liquidity to someone else that needs it and the reason that they're paying you and what they're offering you is hopefully something that stores wealth and generates income. So. If you buy an asset, right, so let's say you buy a stock and you buy it for $100 a share, right? You buy one share, $100. And you take that asset and you invest it, right? So you invest your asset, uh, you have your stock, you're kind of holding on to it, right? Um, nothing's really happening. Maybe you get a dividend or two for a dollar or two, right? Nothing serious. But then when you go to sell it, it's worth $80, right? So what's happened is you have a capital loss. And there's some cool things you can do with your taxes to defer capital losses and capital gains. So capital gains happen when the opposite happens, right? So if you hold, bought your stock for 100 and then were able to sell it for 120, then your capital gains will have changed, right? So those are your capital losses and capital gains. Exactly, exactly that, right? So. Those are your capital losses and your capital gains, right? Some things create dividend income, right? So some stocks will pay consistent dividends, so they'll pay you just for owning the stock, basically, and they'll pay you a part of their earnings for owning the stock, right? Things like saving accounts also create interest, right? And that's another way that you can maximize and then diversify. Diversify your income, right? So what you're doing is you're basically looking at your income and you're saying, okay, well, my income comes from one place, right? And we'll talk about how you do this, but let's say your income comes from one place, just your job, right? What if you lose your job? That sounds like a terrible proposition, right? That sounds like a terrible proposition. So what you need to do is you need to try to diversify where your money's coming from so that you can take advantage of what's going on, right? So that you can have more opportunities if something goes wrong. Now, the third thing that assets can do, besides earning you income and storing wealth, is that they can reduce expenses. They can reduce expenses. And what that means is that an asset can reduce expenses if what you're spending right now is more expensive. So let's say that you wake up every morning and you go to work, right? So this is your house. You got a nice little chimney, right? And then this is your job. It's like one of those bland corporate offices with all the, all the windows, okay? Kind of looks like jail, but it's a job, okay? So you go over there and every day you take an Uber, right, for $50 to work. Right? Now, it's not, e it's not difficult to think about how buying a car at this cost, even an exorbitantly you know, expensive car, how buying a car is going to reduce your overall expenses right? and increase the actual income that you're able to take home. And so that's one of the things you need to consider when looking at different assets. Excuse me. My nose is itchy. I think I'm, I'm sniffing a lot of dust. 
All right. So those assets reduce your living expenses, right? And it's not always immediate, right? So at first, it might actually cost you more to have the car because you're making large payments and so on and so forth. But once you've paid it off, you might be a lot more successful, right? So let's do a quick review of this section and move on to our next piece. So assets are items with economic value, with economic value that can be converted into cash. Right? That's a necessity. If you can't convert an asset into cash, once again, that's a possession. Right? What do assets do? They create income. They store wealth. And they reduce expenses. It's not even difficult to imagine a scenario where you do all three of these, right? So let's say you buy a house that has two separate, it's a two family house, right? So you're able to buy a house, right? Which stores your wealth because assets tend to appreciate in price such as houses, right? And reduces your expenses because you're no longer paying rent. And then you can rent out the extra room or the extra apartment to create income, right? So you can hit all three at the same time. Now, whatever asset you choose to invest in, right, selling the capital to get it can be more lucrative than selling labor, right? And it won't be in the beginning necessarily, but over time, it most definitely will be. And the reason it most definitely will be over time is because you only have 24 potential hours of labor per day. Right? So you're only able to sell 24 hours of labor every single day. On the other hand, your capital is unlimited in how much you can sell in a day and how much you can move around. Right? And that's just a simple math that makes it so that selling capital over time is going to give you better results. So the next thing we want to talk about is a concept, is the concept of debt and equity. Debt and equity. So, buying capital, right? So if you go out and you buy capital, which is commonly known as just borrowing, right? Um, enables you to invest without first owning the capital, right? So you're able to buy a home without first owning the money needing to do it, right? This means you're using someone else's money to buy this asset or this investment, right? And what you're assuming is that you'll be able to repay it with your future earnings. With your future earnings. And this is pretty important, right? You're assuming that you'll be able to repay it with your future earnings, right? So, but borrowing capital to be able to do something like that, to be able to finance a house with a mortgage, right, has costs. This is going to have costs, right? So the asset will have to either increase your wealth, right, or your earnings will have to rise, right, or the income that you receive will have to increase, right? So let's talk about that two-family house situation. If you buy a two-family house, the two-family house will appreciate in value, so you'll be able to pay off your debt at the end by selling your house, right? If you have to make interest payments regularly, and what you do is you take the second apartment and you rent it out, you'll be able to make interest payments out of that rent, right? So in that way, you can borrow money from someone else that has it, buy the house and then pay it back over time by doing an investment like that, right? And that's an important thing to understand, right? So most commonly, right, of course people borrow money for houses and cars and all kinds of things, but one of the most common ways and one of the largest amounts that we do is for companies, right? And companies call this an initial public offering, right? Or a further, a secondary public offering when they come back to the markets and they offer something. But in 2004, Google bought capital on the market, right? And what they gave in return is they gave a piece of their future success, right? So they shared their future success 
and their future failure, if it was to happen, with investors, right? So any money they made, any value that they accumulated, would belong to the people that they sold the stocks to. They also split up the risk, right? So rather than taking on all the risk by themselves, they shared the risk with the investors, right? And the gains, right? So, and that's what ends up happening when companies borrow money. And the reason companies borrow money is that opportunities happen pretty quickly, right? Although you may be generating enough cash to take advantage of an opportunity in 10 years, it might be more important to take advantage of the opportunity in less. Okay. So when you borrow, you rent someone's money, right? That's kind of the, the easiest and most direct way to understand it. So you're renting someone's cash. And when you're renting someone's cash, the result is debt, right? So you create debt. And so when you're borrowing, you want to make sure that you can service both the interest and the principal at the end. Right? Because no matter how much you borrow, even if you owe interest over time, you will then have to pay back the original amount as well as any interest that it's accumulated. Right? So debt for you is a liability. Right? So if you borrow money, debt is a liability, which simply means that you are liable to pay it back. Right? You are responsible for paying it back and that will be your, your obligation under this contract or under this agreement. Furthermore, in contrast, the cost of equity, the cost of equity needs to be paid only due to an increase in income. In income. So if a company sells equity and their income isn't increasing, they won't owe any additional money to their investors, right? They will just owe whatever they've owed over time, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So the important thing here is that if you are in a debt contract, right, equity is, is much cheaper because of that, right? Equity is much cheaper than debt in that sense. So it's much better for companies to issue stocks rather than issue bonds. And this changes from time to time, and there's a capital mix, but that's not really what we're talking about in this class, right? But overall, you should know that the cost of equity, right, or the cost of owning a piece of something is going to be lower than the cost of just borrowing the cash up front, right? And so an important thing to remember, because this is a personal finance class, is that you are charged interest if you have credit cards, right? And those interest rates are negotiable from time to time. So what you can do is every few months, you can contact your credit card company and you can say the following. Well. I would like to reduce my interest payments for my car. And the reason is I believe I have a strong credit history, I've regularly been paying on time, and I'm able to reduce my interest, right? And that's something that you should be doing because they're never going to reduce the interest for you, right? You're only going to have to ask for it. But if things go wrong, they will increase your interest in return. The next thing to consider is the value of debt. And the value of debt includes the benefit of having an asset sooner rather than later. So let's say you're buying a house, right? And let's say you have kids. You just had kids and you're buying a house. Now your kids are going to be able to go out and play in the yard and have a great time and have fun and relax, right? Outside and enjoy it. Now, you could borrow the money now and have the house while they're young and while you're young enough to enjoy it. Or... You could save up money for the next 20 years, and then when your kids are 20 years old, buy a house, right? And the problem with the latter scenario is that if you buy a house in that situation, there's no one to get joy from it anymore, right? And so the reality is that some of the value of debt is in having the assets sooner rather than later, right? Another perhaps terrible example is financing education, right? So 
a lot of the times the thing the thing that's espoused or said is that well education costs a lot of money in the United States because you have a higher income with that education right besides that being not necessarily a baseless claim but one that is yet to be proven in the long run right what we also know is that other countries are able to do it for free right and so there's a societal benefit to having an educated population and that education is an opportunity for people to succeed and for people to do well right and so putting a lot of people in debt doesn't make sense but it's important that I explain kind of the rationale and the rationale is well if I borrow money to get my education now instead of later then I can do a job and that job will pay me more money right and so, you know, as ridiculous as that is, that is the current situation. By the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask me questions. Let me check if there are any questions. I'm not sure if there are any questions. There's a lot of stuff happening in the chat. Don't see any questions. So, if there are any questions, uh, please let me know and you know just put them in the chat and I'll address the questions as we go along um, so the next thing okay I gotta make sure I gotta make sure I'm in the right place all right oh so this is important right so I think the paying for education is totally ridiculous absolutely ridiculous so my goal with these streams and with what I do is to make education free for anyone with an internet connection Right? And I'm going to work tirelessly to make that goal a reality. So that bullshit about you have to pay for an education because you'll earn more money later is total nonsense. And my work is trying to prove that it's total nonsense. All right. So let's review this section. What we know is that financing assets through equity means sharing ownership. means sharing ownership which means that you owe both you own both the downside and the upside of that business right financing assets through borrowing means the following right that you take on the financial obligation to repay financial obligation to pay and so your financial plan will have to contain some contingency plans in order for you to be able to pay for what you're borrowing, right? Equity and debt both have costs and value, and they're important to, do, to evaluate when you're making a decision, right? And know that both are almost always available to you, right? And they both allow you to buy an asset sooner. And so there's an additional value to you in being able to buy it sooner because you're able to enjoy it for longer. Right? You know, as is kind of the, the fundamental case, we're all here for a limited time. And because we're all here for a limited time, the ability to enjoy an asset for two thirds of my life instead of one third of my life is going to make a difference. I need to take a drink. Right, one second. Ah, okay. Delicious iced coffee. All right. Okay, now on to income and risks. So as we move into income and risks, right, personal finance isn't about getting what you want, right? Most of the time, it's actually about protecting what you have. So this will often change, right? But the majority of the time, a lot of your priority is going to be on protecting what you already own, protecting the lifestyle that you already have, the things that you're already used to, and in addition, getting some more things, right? But the majority of your time is going to be concerned with that. So since we're assuming that you have some surplus of income, right? You have some surplus coming in, you need a way to protect that surplus, right? Now, if you have a job and you work for someone and they're able to fire you at any minute, that's a massive risk, right? That's a huge risk. If you have to then go ahead and find a different job and not have income for some time, you'll be in difficult trouble. So you wanna to try to diversify your income sources, right? And the way you diversify your income sources is by investing your surplus income into something that generates income for you over time, right? 
This is also commonly known, this whole thing, as not putting all your eggs in one basket, right? Which I'm sure you've heard in the past. Okay, next. So diversification is always brought up with investments, right? So you need to diversify your investments you know, don't invest all your money into Apple, right? Although that probably wasn't a good idea, you know, wasn't a bad idea 15, 20 years ago, right? But overall, it's not a good idea to have your investments all in one basket. It's also not a good idea and probably a worse idea to have all your income in one basket, right? So if you're selling it to one person, like I said before, you're going to run into some trouble, right? So let's imagine our fictional friend Mark, right? And our fictional friend Mark has stuff figured out, right? Mark is a school counselor. So he has income coming in, right? And his income is made up of things like health insurance and retirement benefits and all that stuff. But he also gets a bi-weekly or a monthly paycheck or a weekly paycheck, whatever it is, but a regular paycheck. He also tutors on the side, right? So he gets some other income coming in, right? In the summers, he paints houses. So that's another source of income coming in, right? And then finally, he buys and sells Sports memorabilia, right? Sports stuff in his free time online, right? And so what happens in this situation if Mark's school lays him off? Mark's fine, right? He might not have as much income as he had before, but he still has sources of income. Now imagine, for example, if we were instead looking at a person that was just a school counselor and had no other source of income, right? If that person was to get laid off, they would have no source of income whatsoever. They'd inevitably have to go into debt. They'd inevitably have to quickly find a job, settle for whatever they have, right? Lose their leverage in the labor market. Whereas when Mark goes back to negotiate, if he doesn't like something about the job, he's going to get his way because he has other things that he can do in the meantime. Okay, so. Make sure that you try to diversify your income. You should also then try to diversify your investments, right? Just like your sources of capital, you wanna make sure that the things that you're investing in are different enough that you're able to make money in different ways, right? So, excuse me, whether it's in capital markets or in labor markets, diversification is absolutely critical, right? Absolutely critical because you don't wanna be exposed to just one random shock. Right, and so as a review, right, this is a rather short section, so just as a review, remember, try to diversify your income and try to figure out how you can diversify your income in the best way. Getting a second job might not always be the best thing, but you might have some hobby that can make you a little money on the side and try to figure out if you can do that in order to diversify your income and make yourself more secure, right? So that's one of the things to consider for your future financial plan. Okay, so we move on to the next section. The next section is a section called financial statements. And so basically the idea is, right, we've looked at all these things and we understand the basics of finance, right? But we need a set of tools to be able to look at these things without every single time thinking, well, what's my income? How much am I making? Let me take out the calculator. We need a way to be able to have a snapshot, look at it for a day, look at it for a week, look at it for a month, look at it for a year, and make some decisions. And it's going to inform our goals and show us our weaknesses, right? And the tool that we're going to use are financial statements, right? So since the very first person could count sheep, I had a sudden need to draw a beautiful sheep. So that's a sheep. Oh, wait, our sheep needs more legs. Our sheep has four legs and a little tail, right? And a, and a very he human looking head, right? Accounting was born, okay? So accounting is extremely important, extremely, extremely important. As a matter of fact, Warren Buffett, the famous investor who was enormously rich and probably the most successful investor of our time, if not in history, um, basically said the following. When asked what he learned at his MBA, right, at his master's in business administration, the most important thing he learned without blinking he said, account it, right? That was the most important thing that he picked up in that time. So, what this is going to give you, it's going to give you the tools 
for understanding your financial position, for understanding your spending and your income and how your money is moving around, right? So clay tablets were first used by Sumerian traders to keep records, right? And that was thousands and thousands of years ago, right? And so today's accounting is called accrual accounting, right? And this is what most businesses use. And accrual accounting accounts for things that haven't traded with cash necessarily. So it accounts for cash, but it also accounts for trading of goods. It accounts for the future. It, it accounts for the recent past over long distances and in different amounts. So there's no physical exchange of cash, right? Instead, you and I will be focusing on cash accounting. And cash accounting is specifically, specifically targeted to every time cash is exchanged. So every time you pay something, every time you receive cash by borrowing something, you're going to be following cash accounting. So the most, you know, I mean, modern cash accounting was developed sometime in the 1500s, right? Or excuse me, modern cash accounting is much older. Modern accrual accounting was developed sometime in, in the 1500s due to a need uh, for ex exploding and basically expanding trade, right? So as trade got farther and farther away from the source, it became more and more important to keep track of all the different risks and all the different amount of money moving around and everything else, right? And so we developed accrual accounting, right? But we'll be focusing on a cash accounting, which is a lot simpler, right? It makes a lot more sense and is a lot more immediate, right? You pay for something, you receive something, right? It's pretty straightforward. There's not really a lot of, you know, changes going on there, right? So financial decisions result in transactions, right? Which are actual trades that buy, sell, borrow, and invest. All right, so in that process, right, you're going to be tracking for buying and selling the flows in and out, right? So as things buy, as you buy, you, the cash flow goes out, and as you sell, the cash flow goes in, right? And we're also talking about selling labor and capital here. And as you borrow and invest, you're also going to be tracking your current position, right? And so we've already talked about some of these excuse me, some of these income statements, right? But they're going to be important in understanding what you do, right? So all of this is recorded in, in a few places, right? It's recorded in your income statement. And we'll go over each of these in detail. Income statement, your cash flow statement, and your balance sheet. And you're going to need each of these, not only individually and not only interconnected, but you're going to need them over time as well in order to make good financial decisions. Right? So, the income statement will track the relative size of your income and expenses. Right, so if your income is $2,000 and your expenses amount to about $1,800, you'll be able to see how much of that is rent, how much of that is your car, how much of that is a latte, right? For your cash flow statement, you're going to be thinking about more about your liquidity situation. So how much cash is moving in and out, right? So if you buy a computer, right, that might affect your cash flow statement because you pay cash for it, right? If you're later able to sell the computer because you, let's say you bought it broken and you invested a little bit and you were able to sell it for a little more, your cash flow comes back in. And so that nets out how much cash you have going in and out of the system at all time, right? And then your balance sheet isn't going to be over time like all of these, right? So the first two exist over a period of time, right? Your balance sheet, however, only exists in a snapshot, in a specific moment. Okay, so let's go into more specifics, excuse me, on the income statement. And before I do anything else, I'm going to take a five minute break. I think we've been streaming for, yeah, I've been lecturing for a little over two hours. So I'm gonna take a five minute break just to refresh uh, and then I will come back in and we will do awesome things with financial statements, 
learn how to use them in order to take advantage of our financial situation. If in the meantime you guys have had any questions along the way, feel free to ask them and I will be right back. Huh, I'm not sure about that. Can you tell me where my status is showing as a way? Is it on uh, on Discord that it's showing as a way? Because I'll have to change that. I'm not sure if I haven't linked the accounts or I might just have it as a way 
from before. Um, so I'll make sure I'll make sure to definitely look into that. Oh, I like that A plus. That's cool. I like that A plus a lot. All right. Um, excuse me. Okay. Now back to income statements. So your income statement summarizes your expenses and your income, right? So in general, it's basically how much money are you taking in and how much money are you spending to get there, right? That's all of your income, including wages and interests and everything else. Oh, through the fellowship announcements. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for dropping by. It's awesome that, that, that that's coming up there now. I will make sure to change the away status to something else. I will do that as soon as we're done here. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so your expenses are the cost of things in your daily living. And your income is, of course, what you make in money, right? Now, as you accumulate more and more income, as you have excess income, what you'll accumulate is wealth, right? So you'll have more and more wealth coming in. And as your wealth is coming in, you'll be able to build new sources of income, right? This is a pretty, pretty direct way. So, what are you? Sometimes just glance at the names. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll definitely, I'll definitely make sure that I, um, that I have it on there and that I have my account connected. Yeah, that's a good idea, right? So, the other thing that income statements are very useful, besides being able to see your expenses and your income, right, and how quickly or, or how slowly you're accumulating wealth, is for their level of detail, right? So you'll be able to see how much money you make from your job how much money you spend on clothing, how much money you spend on food or on rent, right? And the relative impact of those investments, right? And how to make the greatest impact towards your goals. So let's say your goal is to save more money or to pay more debt. Maybe you could cut out one of your expenses or limit them, or maybe it's time to increase your income in some other way, right? And so it's, this allows you to identify the least expensive, least expensive, and least expensive in terms of effort, right? way to get closer to your goals right? and that's going to be very important the next statement that we're going to look at after the income statement is the cash flow statement cash flow right and so the cash flow statement will show you how much cash is coming in and going out over the course of some period of time, whether that be a week or a month or a year, right? And so this may not appear in your income and expenses. And the reason it may not appear is that your expenses on a regular basis don't involve probably buying computers, right? And so buying a computer would be a cash outlay, right? Let's say you decide to borrow money to buy a house. You would have cash coming in and then immediately going out to create a new asset, right? to pay for the house. And so what this will show you is how good you are at creating liquidity. At creating liquidity. Which means how good you are at making sure that you have enough cash on hand to cover all of your expenses and how well the value of your cash is stored, right? Excuse me. So your cash flow statement will actually be segmented into some subtotals. I need a new piece of chalk, and luckily, I have a whole pile of broken chalk down here, right? So, your cash flow statement will be all part of subtotals, right? So you'll have a bunch of different subtotals that you can look at in order to gain a little more, a little more insight, right? So for example, you have operating, operating expenses, right? And operating income. That's how much you get from just your regular day-to-day -day activities of working and eating and all of that stuff, right? You'll have stuff for financing, right? Which will allow you to see how much money you're paying towards servicing your debt, right? Or how much money you're receiving from debt that you have allowed someone else to take on, right? And finally, you'll have investing, 
right? So let's say you buy some rare coin, right, for $2,000. And let's say in five years on your cash flow statement, you're able to sell it for 5000 right? So your investing activity, if you take a five-year span on your cash flow, will reflect a $2,000 cash increase due to that investment. And that will appear in that section. And then finally, you have something called free cash flow. Right? And free cash flows are what's left over after you've taken your operating expenses and your income, subtracted or added any financing, subtracted and added any investing, and this is the cash that's left over for you to invest, for you to you know, take on more wealth or spend or do whatever it is that you need to do with it. So that's your cash flow statement. Right? The next thing is the balance sheet. So before I move on, let me cover something very important, right? I'm not, I, I'm not going to give you a demonstration of how to create a balance sheet or how to create a cash flow statement because the majority of the software that you use will do that for you, right? And just like long division or spelling, creating these things manually is no longer as valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I know I'll, I'll definitely be uploading this to YouTube once I'm done. Thank you for tuning in. And um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll segment it later. I probably won't segment it. I'll upload it as one block. So you'll have to jump to like two hours or whatever it is. But hey, have a great evening or a great day or whatever time it is where you are. And um, yeah, just watch it on YouTube. Thank you so much for being here. Catch you later. All right. Um, so I'm not going to teach you how to make these statements because the reason is if you input your expenses into accounting software and we'll go through accounting software towards the end of the lecture, you'll be able to pull up a balance sheet. What you need to understand is the insight that it gives you. And that's what I'm trying to teach you here, right? So the balance sheet is sometimes called a statement of financial condition, right? And the reason it's called that is because it's only going to show you a specific point in time, right? So if your other statements can show you a three month span, right? Your balance sheet will only appear at a specific point in time and show you exactly what's going on, right? So it's not on a continuum like all your other things. So your balance sheet is going to be made up of assets, which are things that can be traded for liquidity, like we said before, or for cash. It's going to be made up of liabilities, which are debts that you owe or you know other, other things that you owe money on, right? And the difference between these two, assets mi minus liabilities, is going to be equal to your net worth. Right? And your net worth is composed of the following. Right, So you can imagine net worth as the following. If you were to take everything you own right now and sell it, pay back all the debt that you owe, the remainder is a net worth. Right, If your net worth is negative, you should be working very hard to get it out of the negative. Right, If your net worth is negative for too long, you'll be forced to declare bankruptcy because you won't be able to address your liabilities. Right, But this is exactly the kind of insight that, a, that the balance sheet will give you. So, let's do a quick review of this section and move on to comparing and analyzing financial statements. So here's the review. There's three commonly used financial statements, the income statement, the cash flow statement, and the balance sheet. The results for a period of time on the income statement and the cash flow statement, so these are going to be a period of time, right? Some continuum, and a balance sheet is going to be in a moment, right? Your income statement lists your income and your expenses. Your cash flow statement is your operating expenses and so on and so forth, so things that are coming in and out in terms of cash, right? And your balance sheet lists assets, liabilities, and importantly, the difference, which is your net worth. And in the event that your net worth is negative for too long, which means that your assets are not large enough to service your liabilities, you'll end up in bankruptcy. Businesses literally end up in bankruptcy almost immediately if this happens, right? But you will have some time to kind of recoup and figure out your way, perhaps by borrowing more or by having an opportunity to take out another job. Um, the reason I do the little review sections here is because I miss stuff. Right, so it's not always the case that uh, I, I, you know, I think people need a review, and I think it's nice to have a review just to see what we covered and what was important. But sometimes I miss stuff in my own notes, 
And when I miss stuff in my own notes, I'm able to, I'm able to go back and catch up on it if I catch it in the review. Okay, so comparing and analyzing financial statements. So comparing and analyzing. So a tool is only as good as how you use it, right? If you use a hammer to go fishing, you're probably not gonna be very successful. If you use a screwdriver, well, screwdrivers are pretty useful in general. It's hard to think of something that you could use a screwdriver that's not that useful, but you get the point. A tool is important, right? A tool is important, but how you use it is going to be even more important. So one of the things that you're going to do when you organize all this information, right? So these three statements allow you to organize your entire financial position into an easy to understand way. Right? You organize it into something that's easy to understand, it's easy to interpret, that's easy to see, right? Easy to see on the surface. And so what you need to do now is you need to take those statements and you need to make them even more useful for yourself, right? So one of the ways you're gonna start making it more useful for yourself is by making them common size. And what that means is the following, right? So if you have an income statement that, for example, says, like we said before, right, you earn a thousand dollars. You earn a thousand dollars, right? You spend five hundred on rent. You spend three hundred on lattes, and you pay a hundred dollars towards your debt, right? So this is rent. These are lattes, and you pay a hundred dollars to your debt, and then you save a hundred dollars. Obviously, this is not a realistic example because you don't eat anything but lattes, right? But what you do with a common size statement is you express it in percentages. So fifty percent of your income goes to rent. 30% of your income goes to lattes, 10% of your income goes to servicing your debt, and 10% goes to savings, right? Now, if you were to glance at this in a moment, right, if you were to glance at it without this piece right here, if you were to just to say, okay, well, 500, 300, you know, I don't know, 500 is a big number, right? But if you look at it this way, right, and these numbers are simplified and there's not that many of them, but the percentages become useful because when you're spending 30% of the money that you're earning on lattes, you might have an addiction, right? This might actually this might actually be a problem, not not you know not just an indulgence from time to time, but you, you might need to go seek therapy or speak to somebody about this issue, right? So you're going to be able to identify problems much easier when things are common size, right? So on a cash flow statement, right, you're going to look at your different subtotals, and so you're going to have inflows and outflows as a percentage of their own subtotals, right? So for example, if 10% of your inflows come from investing, right? If 30% of your inflows come from finding cash on the floor, right? Either you're making a very small amount of cash and you happen to find $3 that year, right? or you seem to have some kind of supernatural talent for finding cash. But once again, it's going to allow you to identify where most of your money is coming from and allow you to diversify more effectively and more quickly in order to make sure that your income is secure. And then finally, your balance sheet can also be made common size. And how you're going to do that is you're going to make everything a percentage of the assets. Right, so for example, if your only if your only asset is a house and it's worth a thousand dollars, right, and you owe nine hundred dollars for a mortgage, and then you owe three hundred dollars for a credit card, right? Excuse me, a hundred dollars for a credit card. Let's make it simple. I don't, I don't, I don't really think I can do complex math right now. But let's just say this is going to be ninety percent of your assets are locked up in a mortgage, and ten percent of your assets are locked up in credit cards. And so you have a net worth of zero in this situation, but you're able to see how much of your net worth corresponds to your assets and how much you owe compared to how much you actually own, right? The next thing you're gonna to wanna to look at is relating the financial statements. So you've already made them common size, right? So they're easy to interpret. Right? So if your income is a million dollars, if things are common size, things are still going to be from 1% to 100%, right? If your income is $10, they're still going to be from 1% to 100%, right? And so it's easy to scale up the numbers and percentages and see the relative impact of everything that's going on. And as your financial statements increase in complexity, this will provide you with more and more insights, right? The next thing you'll be able to do is relate them, right? And the way you relate them is the following, right? So 
You take a certain point in time, time zero, right? And you look at the balance sheet. You look at your balance sheet. So you look at your current situation, which is what we started out with doing in this lesson, right? Then, let's say three months passes, right? Three months passes. And so over here, you look at your income statement and your cash flow statement. Right? And you see what's happened over those three months. And then three months from now, right, you look at your balance sheet again. And you start to see the impact that this has had on your balance sheet. The impact that the decisions for your income and your cash flow have had on your new balance sheet. And then you start the process again. Right? The reason I do three months is that's a quarterly iteration. Right? Sometimes it's okay to do it every year if you're income situation and everything isn't changing too much, but as long as there's some change and you're working on this process, getting more practice is better, right? So when I started out, I was actually doing this monthly. Now I'm doing this quarterly, right? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how I do this personally in the, um, at the end of the lecture. Okay, so what you start to see is you start to see these relationships and you start to see the consequences of your actions, right? So if you took some actions to create more income by investing in assets, right? You went ahead and you ended up in a situation where now on your balance sheet you have more assets, right? But perhaps you might even have a lower net worth. And the reason you might have a lower net worth is maybe to acquire those assets you borrowed money. Right? So the next thing that happens or the next thing you can look at is called ratio analysis. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't remember these ratios by heart, so I'll be looking a lot off of my paper. But what I'm trying to give you isn't what you should write down or remember 100% and say, well, these are the ratios I'm using. What I'm trying to give you is I'm trying to show you how we can take these three relatively simple statements and leverage them in order to answer very, very complex questions. So for example, how much income is used up by my expenses, right? And what you would do there is you would take net income Right? We'll abbreviate it as net I and divide it by total income. And all of a sudden, you know exactly how much of your income is consumed by your expenses. Right? How big is the income supporting the assets, which is just net income over total assets. Right? What is my return on net worth? How much asset value is financed by debt? Another question would be how large is debt relative to net worth? Right? So if your debt is larger than your net worth, you've got a problem. Another question you could ask is how well does income cover interest expense? So if you owe debt because you've borrowed to invest in an asset that's making you some income, how well does your income cover that debt, right? If you've just borrowed to buy a house and it's not making you any income and you're relying on making money every single week in order to pay it off, how well does it cover it, right? Does it cover it well enough? Or are you in a situation where you're very close to the edge, right? And maybe you need to start rethinking what you do. <laughs> My cat just laid down on the pile of papers. Um, and then finally, you could look at your cash flows, right? So how much do payments for investments and financing take from my income, right? So let's say I borrowed some money and I want to know how much of my income goes into just servicing that debt, just paying it off on a regular basis, right? So you'll be able to find all of these things within your software. You'll be able to use it on a regular basis, right? And what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with the freedom to go ahead and say, okay, well, I've got these three simple financial statements, right? This is the value that I kind of want to communicate with this piece of the lesson is that we've started with three financial statements, right? And we've ended up with one, a way to see the impact of decisions through time, impact of decisions, right? We can see the relative impact of every component right and we can find out and stress test our own income situation in order to understand what goals may be important to set in the short term and in the long term right and this is just by using these three base financial statements right and so we're going to look at how to do that right but rather than kind of show you and demonstrate how the financial statements work. Like I said before, right, long division and spelling 
are not that important to learn. You need to learn the basics of how things work, but after that, right, there's software that can do it for you. And so you should be relying on accounting software. Right? And your accounting software is going to do the following. Right? You're going to be able to collect data. Now, if you do most of your spending electronically, you're going to be able to download this from your bank statements and so on and so forth and import it directly. Right? If you don't do it mostly electronically or if you don't want to bother with that, you can just simply input it once a month or once every three months step by step. Right? At the end of the day, even if you import the data, you'll often have to categorize it. Right? So when you go to a local store, you might be buying food, you might be buying computer parts, you might be buying different things. And so your bank might not know exactly what you're spending your money on. Right? And so you're going to have to integrate that in some way. You're going to have to answer those questions. Right? Now, once you've gone ahead and collected that data and put it in, you're going to be able to generate reports. And the reports that you're going to be generating are these three financial statements, your income statement, your cash flow statement, and your balance sheet, right? Generating these statements will allow you to then have the insights that you need to understand where you are, what progress you've made, evaluate your past decisions, and so on and so forth, right? So, there's really one major thing to consider when you're looking at the software, right? A, a very important thing is perhaps security, right? So if you're not comfortable with someone selling your data, probably don't use something that's web connected, right? Um, I, I've tried, you need a budget, right? I, you know, I like that software a lot. It's pretty interesting, it's easy to use, and it's, it's available on Steam, right? Which I think a lot of people will already have installed, and it's at a good price point, which is about $30, right? So. That might be a little bit expensive if you're thinking about budgeting your $100 that you have to spend every month, right? But it's not that expensive when you think about the long-term impact of being able to do this on a regular basis, track your expenses, and obviously save money and do better, right? So there's others, there's Quicken and Money Dance, and you can just look around for what you're doing and you'll be able to do things like make, um, make projections and make budgets and so on and so forth and try to control your spending and predict your spending in different ways. But the most important thing you'll be able to do is you'll be able to do what if scenarios, right? And your what if scenarios are going to be critical to your goal planning. So what happens if I take out $5,000 worth of debt at 6%, right? What happens if I lend my friend $5,000 and don't charge him any interest, right? What happens to my statements? What happens to my cash flow? What happens to my income statement over time if I do the following? And these what-if scenarios are going to be great to experiment and understand how realistic and how timely your goals are, right? And how good your decisions or bad your decisions might be, right? So look through the personal finance software. There's going to be a lot of it. There's going to be quick and I can list off a few more. There's Money Dance, Ace Money, YNAB, Bank Tree Pro, Rich or Poor, Budget Express, Account Express and iCash. There's home bookkeeping, three click budget, and then you can use Microsoft Excel, right? You can just use Excel. You can figure this out yourself. There's plenty of templates that you can download. Um, and as a final note, I'll mention the following. So I personally tried YNAB, but I no longer use software for my account. And I don't use software for my accounting because I found that I would rush through this process. And rushing through this process isn't good. So I found that I needed time to reflect. And because I needed time to reflect, what I actually did was I did this with pen and paper. And so there's something valuable about sitting down and writing that, okay, well, I've made $50 in income off of my savings this month. Right? Or I spent $100 on clothing this month. Right? And physically writing that out because it takes time. And as it takes time, you're able to digest and process everything that's happening. And you're able to think about, well, how would I do things differently? Would I really be able to do this a different way? Right? You're able to think of anecdotes and scenarios in your life. Well, okay, maybe I bought extra clothing because my son was born and he needed clothes. And so on and so forth. But I use pen and paper, right? But for starters and for understanding how these statements work, I really do recommend using accounting software. All right. That concludes our lecture for today. Uh, once again, I am Dennis the Professor. This is Personal Finance, and we're looking at the tools to help manage debt, create wealth, and get to income independence.
Let's see if there are any questions. What's the name of the Steam software again? Yeah, sure. The Steam software is Y N A B, which stands for you need a budget. And if someone from you need a budget sees this video and you'd like to support my cause and my teaching, do reach out to me. I'm not sponsored by you guys. I actually don't take sponsorships or advertisement because I think that doesn't belong in education. But if you want to donate and support, I would appreciate it. So if anybody knows somebody from YNAB, let me know. I actually really like this software.